welcome to Arbitral Insights, a podcast series brought to you by our international arbitration practice lawyers here at Reed Smith. I'm Peter Rocha, Global Head of Reed Smith's International Arbitration Practice. I hope you enjoy the industry commentary, insights and anecdotes we share with you in the course of this series, wherever in the world you are. If you have any questions about any of the topics discussed, please do contact our speakers. And with that, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Arbitral Insights podcast series. And I'm delighted today to have as our guest the amazing Purna Mahati. Hello, Purnima. Hello, Gautam. Lovely to be with you. It's great to have you with us on this podcast. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Uh, for those of you who don't know Purnima, Purnima is a co-founder of the law firm Samvad Partners and she heads up the dispute resolution practice. She's based in the Bangalore office, and she has a wealth of experience in a number of areas, uh, both in litigation and arbitration, and also investigations and mediation. She's not only an arbitrator as well, but she's also a qualified mediator. I last saw Purnima in uh, February in Mumbai, when uh, we were both involved in the Global Arbitration Review Conference in Mumbai, and uh, Purnima was on our arbitrators panel as part of our Q&A, and that was great. It was a session that I had the great honour of uh, chairing and moderating. For those of you who don't know, just a bit of trivia, Samvad has a very interesting meaning in Sanskrit and in Hindi. It has a number of meanings, but uh, amongst other things, it means to communicate, to gather to discuss things, to converse. Uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful meaning for a law firm because ultimately that is what we do as practitioners. So Purnima, it's a delight to have you with us and uh, I'm really looking forward to our discussion. So let me ask you first of all, how did you find law or how did law find you? Thank you, Gautam. It's an absolute pleasure to be talking to you today. And thank you for reading up about the firm as well. Uh, that shows, you know, the, the deep interest you have and in, in who you're having a conversation with. So before I get to your first questions, uh, Samvad actually has its roots in, in Sanskrit, which means Samavada, which literally means equal dialogue. So, you know, in any context, um, you know, whoever we're talking to, we have to keep reminding ourselves that there may always be a different perspective, um, a different idea, whether it's our clients, whether it's our internal stakeholders, uh, whether it's different voices within our own brains. Um, so thank you for, for looking that up. Um, how did I find law? I, I um, come from a family of lawyers and both my parents are lawyers. Interestingly, my mum studied law after both my sister and I were born, you know, and, and sort of studied in the evenings, uh, told us to keep quiet. And, you know, while we did our homework, she studied. So truly amazing to see her then sort of step into courts. But the practice of law that they practice then is very different from the kind of pra- law that, that we practice now. I mean, my mom still asks me, why do I have to go to Bombay and work when, you know, there must be lawyers in Bombay? Uh, and why does somebody have to go from Bangalore? Uh, so I grew up seeing, you know, gowns and bands and, uh, you know, reporters at my home. Um, and then um, the National Law School of India University which Dr. Menon founded, was just sort of taking off and had a great reputation. Um, so a lot of friends encouraged me to apply and said, look, this is going to be different. Uh, and and uh, as you well know, Gautam, um, people who had good grades didn't go to law school in India. Um, they went on to become doctors or engineers or went into the civil service. So, um, you know, I said, uh, let me give this a shot. It looks li- different. And and. F- True enough, um, the experiment has worked. Um, the law school brought together the most interesting number of people I've ever met at any one place. Um, and uh, I really gave that exam, got through, and have not looked back. So uh, it's been an amazing five years at the law school. Opened my mind in different ways. And the law really isn't one thing. So uh, I enjoy being part of the law and, and engaging with the wide uh ecosystem that is the law. So that's how the journey started. Fantastic. Thank you, Purnima. So then, you know, along the way, you've, you like many of us, have had people who've inspired you and who've mentored you. You know, now you're a senior person doing what you do, but there must have been a number of people who've been 
very instrumental to you. So I wonder if you could share some thoughts on who those people were. So I think one of the things that I've always worried about is for the uh, South Asian female lawyer that we don't actually have many mentors who are out there mentoring people actively as in other professions. So uh, actually a friend of mine and I, we've even written a book on leadership and role modeling in in. And, you know, we've edited the book, I should say. And one chapter that we authored was was looking to how we can bring in more role models for young lawyers, uh, both in formal and informal roles. And and we are still trying to work on it. But from a distance, we all uh, thought RBG was fantastic, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and, you know, just the gumption and, you know, and, and the sheer weight of her descent, uh, the fact that she stood out uh, for so long, so much inspiration. When I was in law school, there were some amazing teachers that I looked up to, uh, Professor Sita Ramam, who taught us political science. Uh, there was uh, Professor Elizabeth, who taught us history, but from a from a very, very critical angle, very, very different from the history that we taught, were taught in school. Also, my first boss, uh, Mrs. Pallavi Shroff, um, she was a working mm-hmm. mother. You know, we saw it in practice and uh, never want to say that, you know, I've got to be home at this time or do something else. So it truly played out. She's still a great friend. And, and we did a, a session together at the Bangalore International uh, Centre in terms of equality in the law and how women are still being left out. So today I, I look to every person who can inspire me. There could be somebody within the firm, somebody at the bar, um, you know, anywhere else in the world. But these are some names, Gautam, that, uh, that initially were, were people I drew from. Those so great names, great influences. And, uh, you know, we'll return to some of these themes in a minute because uh, I do want to focus on asking you uh, a number of things about equality, diversity, equality and inclusion, a topic that I know you and I have a great interest in, a great shared interest in and a great passion for. And I want to, we'll, we'll turn to that in a bit. Now, one of the things that, that I mentioned in my introduction of you is that, among, that apart from being a practitioner, you're also an arbitrator, as well as a mediator, but focusing on your arbitrator role. Let's just talk a little bit, though, about how you first got into arbitration. Was it working with certain people on certain matters and you came across arbitration, or were you always interested in arbitration as a discipline? So I think now arbitration has become more separate and distinct discipline. You know, when I started my career about 20 years ago, if you were a litigator in India, you also did arbitration. Or if you were a person interested in arbitration, you also did litigation. You know, going to court was an intrinsic part for the appointment or some sort of intervention in terms of internal relief or the challenge of arbitration awards. So it wasn't a distinct and separate area per se. We have become more specialized. There is a growing arbitration bar which focuses only on arbitration. But even now today, we do see a mixed bag of, of, of dispute resolution folks who do mediation, do arbitration, um, as well as mainstream litigation. So that's how it started. Um, you know, I still remember my first arbitration with the big uh, ICC, oil and gas arbitration uh, we were acting for, we were acting against the state. Uh, there were uh, three different jurisdictions involved. And and just the sheer energy that came into that arbitration really took my breath away. Um, of course, it was far more efficient in terms of time and things were moving. Otherwise, you know, when you are in Indian courts, unfortunately, things don't move as fast. Uh, and the fact that you could actually contribute to seeing all your efforts come to fruition and, and an award is being delivered within a certain period of time really give you, gives you that high, that adrenaline. So I think that's what really attracted me to arbitration. And when you're choosing your tribunal and you're deciding who's part of it, you actually get a say in who's going to hear you. And, and, and that mutual respect once your tribunal knows that, you know, you bring a certain weight to this as counsel, it's quite an equal conversation as opposed to, you know, a very, very hierarchical Indian court systems uh, where you may or may not, for various reasons, actually get your say in court. Uh, so that's the big distinction that drew me in initially uh, into the arbitration world. Wonderful. Thank you. And then, you know, let's turn to your role as arbitrator, because one of the things that you've heard me say a number of times previously, including when we were together in Mumbai 
in February of this year at GAR, Mumbai, is that there just aren't enough female arbitrators. But even more so, looking at India, there are far too few female arbitrators from India. And now things are changing, and a big part of that is people like you. But I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on what more we can do to to encourage people like you. So that's absolutely spot on, Gautam. Um, unfortunately, uh, despite uh, there being many talented, well-regarded uh, women practitioners, somehow that hasn't turned uh, or translated into equally having women arbitrators. What has helped, of course, are the institutions. Uh, I think they are pushing for women arbitrators to be present, and they do understand that that once an institution gives the backing to an arbitrator, they're more acceptable to the parties involved. Uh, so my first appointment was through an institution. Even today, you know, more than 50% of my appointments are through arbitral institutions. And I know, I mean, just before we got in, I, I got a request for a conflict check. It was an ad hoc arbitration. And and I was, you know, telling the counsel who approached me that I wish it, you know, that it would stand uh, and that we would actually see people thinking through. And he told me that, look, I know the firm on the other side and, and we hopefully will see it through and we're conscious that we want a woman. And this would have been unheard of even five years ago. So we still see retired judges we still see male retired judges as the norm, very few women wanting to be in that role. And even once you're in the role, just the skepticism until, you know, you prove yourself is is quite obvious and there to see. So that's something that we should really work against as a community. I think with good law schools coming up, with more professionalization of the, the legal system, let's see how the foreign law firms opening up into the Indian legal community also impacts this sphere. I think we should work consciously towards getting more women or more diverse arbitral tribunals uh, so that, that this really becomes a reality. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Purnima. I mean, I'm as you know, I've said this a number of times, and I'm, I'm, I also have the privilege, amongst other things, of being on the advisory board of Indian Women in International Arbitration, and which is a great organization just recently set up to encourage people of Indian heritage, both in India and outside India, female lawyers, to be a lot more uh, recognized, get more opportunities, and just be more prominent. And um, I mean, you know, one of the people that you mentioned as one of your mentors, Pallavi Shroff. I mean, I know Pallavi very well. She's extraordinary. She's an incredible practitioner, an incredible person. But there are so many people. And, you know, when we were at Gar Mumbai in February, we were blessed to be sitting alongside so many people, women uh, who will be superstars in the very short term, no doubt. You know, so there's a lot to be said on that. Now, that's very interesting. And and I just wonder, you know, just going back to that panel you mentioned that, that you and Pallavi were involved in dealing with equality, I wonder whether you could share with us a few of the themes that came out in that session about equality. So this was, uh, you know, in the thick of things of the pandemic, we decided to put together an equality for women in the law a conversation between various stakeholders. So we had uh, an academic from, from Oxford, Tarunav Kethan. We had Ms. Devan, who is an ASG, Madhvi Devan. And then we had Mrs. Shroff. And we had my friend Sarah Kandiji from the IBA. So the IBA does some excellent work. And right now they're involved in a gender project, which they're collecting data for, you know, I think nine or 12 years across different countries to see how women are doing in various leadership roles within the law. So in India, sometimes I feel that there is such a stark difference. And I think the law firms are making big strides. Um, it's not unusual for a law firm to have women partners. At some point, we have actually a majority of women partners and, and majority in the equity. So uh, for us, it's, it's you know, nothing surprising. It's, it's the way we are. And it's not like it happened by design. It's, it's just that if you have a if you have a place where women are respected and you know welcomed, it will organically happen. But if you go to our courts, you see the representation at bar councils, you see the number of women who are sitting as judges. We're still a far, far cry. And Justice Chandrachud uh, has been talking about it. Justice Ramana was talking about it. But how do we 
you know, get the structural changes to make sure that this is enabled, right? So if you look at, uh, I mean, I'm very conscious of my privilege uh, in in India, uh, you know, in terms of where I stand and, uh, you know, I'm English speaking, I have certain kind of background, I have my own car. But if, for instance, you know, your court lists are coming out at 7.30, 8pm every evening, there are very few women who can get out and start planning their day. They'd rather be putting their kids to sleep. So, you know, there are some structural things that could that really could enable more women to practice. And once you have more women to practice, then you automatically are increasing the pool of your arbitrators and, and your judges. So these are some of the themes that we discussed at this panel that we put together. And why is it not something that judges are thinking about? You know, I spent a few months at Oxford last year, and this was part of my fellowship discussion uh, as a Shivani Gurukul Fellow. And and it's amazing how the strides that you've made in the UK, uh, I mean, there's a conscious thinking about it. Uh, you know, I spoke to the, the reforms that have come through in the UK. Clearly, people are trying to say, you know, what are we thinking about? What are our biases? It's not about gender alone. It could be race, it could be caste, it could be uh, different sexual orientations. So how are we being inclusive? Because the law really touches everybody's lives. So it has to mirror the society that we live in, in every possible way. And until we get and work towards that end, uh, I think we can't really rest. That's very well said. And, you know, I just think someone like you doing what you do, and doing it so well and so prominently, you've got a huge role to play because when people see you doing what you do, it's nothing short of inspirational to other women and supporters of women like me. It's just wonderful to see. And as I say, there'll be many more coming, but there's no doubt that people like you and Pallavi and a number of others of a certain seniority have done so much. So I just want to say, I just want to take a moment to just recognize that and uh, say really well done because um, it has a lot of impact and you should never underestimate that because uh, it really does. So let me turn to a slightly different thing, Purnima, now. So when you sit as an arbitrator, because you obviously have a dual role, you're counsel in some cases, you're arbitrator in other cases. Is there one thing that you would like counsel addressing you to do better? when they're in front of you? From a gender perspective or gender? <laughs> no, just generally. So when counsel are conducting a case before you and your colleagues, if you're sitting on a panel of three, is there one thing in particular that you would like a counsel to do better when they're advocating a case or presenting a case? I think they should be brief. Brevity is, is sort of... Um understated. I think a lot of good counsel come well prepared, but there's just so much time spent in repeating and reiterating what they're saying. I think um, it really would make things more efficient if uh, folks stuck to their script and, and kept it brief. I think that's the sort of the number one thing that I would say. A very brief answer on a very brief issue, which I which which I also agree with passionately because I'm always a big I'm also a big fan of brevity. One of the things that I often get a bit dismayed about is when I see long, need, no, needlessly long statements of case or pleadings or whatever we want to call them. And when you think, wow, it didn't have to be that long at all. Or when skeleton arguments could be a lot shorter and that sort of thing. I just think brevity and making it easy for the a tribunal, making their life easier is such a beautiful thing. Okay, let me turn to a bit of a different topic now. You know, in terms of India and how India has has now really come of age, there was a time when India was emerging as an arbitration superpower. I think we can say it's now emerged as an arbitration superpower. And there have been a number of things that have contributed to that. I just wonder what your thoughts are about the future of India as an arbitral center, because as you know very well, one of the big ambitions of India uh, and a number of the institutions in India and organs of government has been to make India a really prominent center for arbitration. And things like the opening up of the market, which has been announced, may well, as you mentioned earlier, contribute to that significantly. But I wonder whether you might just share some of your thoughts about what more India needs to do to really 
become a really big world player in arbitration. Thank you, Gautam. I think that's a very, very important and present question, if I may say that. So I think the whole ecosystem has to work. It's not just, you know, uh, do we have good enough lawyers or do we have good enough institutions? We're still writing in international institutions quite regularly within our arbitral clauses. So we do really need the domestic institutions to sort of up their game, become more professional, become more recognized, uh, you know, across the country. I'm quite clear that institutional arbitration is the way to go. We also need the continued support of courts to ensure that uh, they understand that arbitration is a separate track. Uh, They have to be non-interventionist. They have to support arbitration uh, and not intervene too much. Uh, And and so that very light touch is important. And that continues to be an important area that that support needs to be given, because if that is taken off, I think it won't work. We have, I think, really, you know, international set of counsel now in India um, in terms of their knowledge of the law, in terms of commercial understanding. I think there's no doubt about that. But we also have to bring up, you know, every other lawyer because India has a large number of lawyers. So part of the inclusion has also to be, you know, are the lawyers who are working in the non-metros understanding of this issue? Because ultimately you may have to go take your award to a tiny town in Kerala or in the deepest parts of Madhya Pradesh to enforce. And and if the judge there doesn't really understand or if your counsel there don't really appreciate what you're trying to do, that may not work. So as a large country with its fair share of chaos, we need to also spread the message to the smaller towns and cities and not really focus on Bombay and Delhi alone. I think that needs to be done and, and the government really has to push its part. I think we could also become more regulatory of, I mean, our regulations and the regulatory framework needs to become more robust. I think. Uh, Part of the opening of the, up of the market will ensure that happens. Uh, you know, we need to have and understand how we're going to compete internationally, how we're going to look to international law firms coming into India. And I'm sure they will because India is such an important part of trade and commerce now, as you rightly said. So we will have the foreign law firms coming in, setting up shop in what form and, in, in, you know, in what strength. We really don't know. But of course, India is of interest uh, and Indian companies are looking to work with international law firms. Uh, So that will happen. So the degree of professionalization will also depend on the regulatory framework and how the regulatory framework responds to this. So I think all of that has to come together. We've got a great uh, set of legal education institutions. Uh, The various national law schools that have been set up are doing very, very well. Uh, Law is no longer a second choice. People are actively wanted to do law, some very bright minds. And we saw a few that you were mentoring at at the GAR when we met and fed. So you know that, uh, and there's a, you know, people are also doing lovely things in legal tech, you know, in India. Uh, So there's a lot of promise. But of course, we have to make sure that it's steered within the right direction. And there's still a, a long path ahead of us. I don't think we're there quite yet. Thank you. That was, that was really interesting. I think, you know, there's a lot more to come, but no, I'm really happy to see how things have progressed because when I first started out in uh, 1991, uh, you know, India had just opened up in terms of the reforms they'd just begun in terms of economic reforms. And it's amazing to see how far India has come and just in terms of the optimism. And it's all absolutely justified because the optimism is going to achieve more and more and more. And I look forward to seeing it in the months to come. Okay, now, you know, this, to use a a phrase that we used at the beginning, this samvad has been very enlightening to me and very enjoyable. And and as you know, very well, Purnima, I can talk for ages. So, you know, like all good things, podcasts like this do need to come to a a close and we're approaching the close. But one of the things that... um, we always like to do in these podcasts is to end our podcasts with a bit of a more lighthearted discussion, which is very popular with our listeners. They enjoy this bit. So I'm going to, I'm not going to break with with my tradition and I'm going to ask you a few of those lighthearted questions. So now you're a very busy person. I, I know that with lots of demands on your time, but if we take music as one thing. Do you have a favorite sort of music or a favorite group or a singer that you particularly like? 
So I'm going to talk to you about dance, actually. So while I love music, I, I learned the Bharatanatyam form of dance, which is a South Indian classical dance, when I was growing up for 12 years. And, you know, I always wanted to continue to dance. And in the pandemic, when things went online, I found a teacher and I'm back to dancing again. So it's difficult to to, to take that two hours every week and find that time. But when you've got the right teacher, it's truly amazing. And, and you know, for the first three months, I was dancing with a group of eight and nine-year-olds who were quite clueless as to what I was doing in their midst and they were not sure whether what to call me but but now you know I've progressed and it's truly amazing and I enjoy doing that so uh so Bharatanatyam and Karnataka classical music together have have found their way back to my life and uh yes I'm enjoying that very much that's wonderful. I mean, you know, see, these things, our listeners should know, these sorts of things are completely unscripted. So I had no idea that Purnima was, was, was going to confirm to me what I've always known is that she's got a lot of rhythm and, and a lot of groove. And so right. you've, just, you've just confirmed to me. That's a very uplifting, inspiring thing that you've got back into dance and a classical dance. And I'm aware of those forms of dance that you mentioned, of course, then again, I mean, what about film? Is the, is is there a particular sort of film, or is there a film that you particularly go back to whenever you can? So I'm a, I'm going to be a bit cheesy and say I like murder mystery movies, and you know I've I've, I've enjoyed the uh, whole Sherlock Holmes on, on Netflix quite a bit. So you know, a fan there, and um, so. Yeah, and I also liked reading the Sherlock Holmes theme, so I think those were some things that I enjoyed. I love Shawshank Redemption as a movie. I think it was very, very interesting. I try and watch the Oscar shortlists every year, so the Everything, Everywhere, All at Once was an interesting movie to watch this year. Um, Again, you've got a female protagonist there and uh, Michelle Yeoh after all these very years uh, for again you know championing the cause uh, was it was you know a very very interesting watch so those are my my film things I do watch the Bollywood blockbusters every now and then but uh, you know my husband's more a, a Hollywood person so together we have to find the time to to watch what works for most of us um, <laughs> you know you sound exactly like me and about everything oh uh, yeah you know I'll just pick up one thing from what you said I think Shawshank Redemption would be on most people's sort of top 10 of all time I think it's one of those classic films in terms of the message in terms of the actual story which is amazing so and then let me end with this is there a particular place or country apart from India that you particularly enjoy visiting so I love traveling I think traveling really opens your mind so I try and travel as much as possible to different parts of the world and try and see new places. I particularly enjoyed, you know, driving around South Island and New Zealand. I visit the UK often, my sister lives there. So, you know, I love going to the UK, but it's sort of going back to working, being with family. Mexico is on my list. So hopefully we'll get there. So is Namibia. So let's see, you know, different parts of the world give you different perspectives. Uh, Last travel was to the Maldives, very, very beautiful, you know, nearby as well. We'd like to see Sri Lanka bounce back soon. Hopefully it will. Another beautiful country nearby and uh, we see a lot of it. But these are my go-to destinations, but hopefully we'll get to Mexico and Namibia next. Superb list. And I've got to tell you, that's, uh, well, I wish you enjoyable travels coming up for sure. Well, look, thank you so much, Purnima. I've thoroughly enjoyed our discussion. It's been really, really good to talk to you. And, you know, you've shared some wonderful insights, which I know our listeners will find incredibly inspirational and uplifting. Thank you very much for being who you are and the example that you set and for the incredible things that you do. And I wish you all continued success. And I look forward to seeing you very, very soon. Thank you, Gautam. It's been an absolute pleasure. Arbitral Insights is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Ali McArdle. For more information about Reed Smith's global international arbitration practice, email arbitralinsights at reedsmith.com. To learn about the Reed Smith Arbitration Pricing Calculator, a first-of-its-kind mobile app that forecasts the cost of arbitration around the world, search Arbitration Pricing Calculator on reedsmith.com or download for free through the Apple and Google Play app stores. 
You can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, Readsmith.com, and our social media accounts at Readsmith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. All rights reserved.